Good morning. I want to welcome all of you this morning. The servers are going to come back right now and collect the offering. Like Dan mentioned, if you're a guest with us, we don't want you to worry about this part. This is for our regular folks. If you give us that little piece of paper that tears off out of your bulletin, we'll be blessed by it. I want to invite you, if you're a guest, to grab one of those orange books that's somewhere close to you. That orange book is a Bible. And if you open it to page 948, you'll be in Mark chapter 11. I invite everybody to open their Bibles to Mark chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 12. We're working way through a series on miracles. And this week, and next week, and then the next week, and then we'll be done with our miracle series. While you're turning to Mark chapter 11, let me make an announcement in this service that I forgot to make in this service last week, and it's about next week. So next week is Easter. That's not a surprise for anybody, I hope. Next week is Easter. We will be at Oma's, and we will have tacos. Now, I want to be very clear. If you're a guest with us this morning, if someone invited you, we would love for you to come next week and ignore this announcement. But for all of my regular folks, we're going to have tacos next week. We're paying for those tacos. We're not going to have any kind of bucket. We're not going to say anything about any kind of money. We want anybody who comes to our Easter service to be blessed with tacos. If you're one of our regular folks, we want you to pay for your taco. But not on Easter Sunday. We're asking you not, we're not going to have anything that happens on Easter Sunday that makes any guests feel like, oh, I, I need to get money out of my pocket, anything like that. But if you would pay a dollar a taco, so if you're going to have five tacos, if you would put five bucks in the offering plate, put it in a bag, say ta- put it in the envelope, say tacos on it, write on your check, tacos, whatever, put it in the offering bag. You could do it today, you could do it in two weeks, just help us cover the cost of these tacos that we're going to give away next Sunday. We will not have a regular offering next Sunday, but we will have a special offering next Sunday, which we always do for Easter for something special. And so it's just going to be for our meal packing party that's coming up. And then let's just know about Omas. We're going to be in a different place at Omas. And this last week, I went with one of our seniors who has all kinds of mobility issues. She was curious if this new venue would work. And when we were leaving, she said, this is perfect. She said, I have no reservations about being to come, being able to come next Easter. It's a new place at Oma's. It's very, very level, all concrete, all bathrooms. Everything is all in one place. Last chance to get rid of these cards that we bought. So we hope that you will take some cards and give them to your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends, And if you'll take my challenge, there's still some of these door hangers out there. I'm taking some home today for my neighborhood. If you'll take this challenge of putting these door hangers around your houses in your neighborhood, we would love for you to do that. Well, let me get rid of my object lessons. Object lessons. Preachers love object lessons. We love to use them. We love it when they work. I've used a few different object lessons in my ministry. You might have been here on the Sunday when I did an object lesson for sin. It's a little secret. You, you put water and you put iodine drops in it when you talk about sin, and it turns it kind of a red color. And then you have another cup that has bleach in it. Well, bleach looks like water. When you put the bleach into it, just drops of bleach, all of a sudden it eats the iodine, and sin is removed, and that's what Jesus does for us. I, I did that object lesson here at church one time. I like that one. I was teaching a group of elementary school kids about Jesus feeding the 5,000, and I was trying to figure out how would I show them that God multiplied. So I bought Jiffy Pop. You remember that from when you were younger, you know, on the stove? And, and most of the kids never even seen it before. They didn't even know what it was. It worked perfect as this thing just exploded, and all of a sudden I had said to them, I bet there's enough in this to feed every kid here. And they all thought that I was crazy. There was no way until it did its jiffy pop thing. Well, I love object lessons, but sometimes they go awry. Sometimes your goal, your purposes are not what are achieved. When I was in college, I preached at a church in Kansas, and I was preaching through 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is a letter in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul is writing to a young man who had come to Jesus and had become a preacher, and Paul had sent him to be a preacher. And Paul's writing a letter to him with about how to do ministry. And so I preached through 1 Timothy and just talked about how all of us are ministers for Jesus. What does this letter teach us? Well, you get all the way to the end of 1 Timothy. And 1 Timothy, Timothy 6.10 is an infamous verse. In 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul says, The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That verse gets used, misquoted all the time. Well, this was the verse that I was to preach on. It just so happened that this was very close to my 21st birthday. And my grandparents had sent me, for my birthday, a $100 bill. So I had a nice, crisp $100 bill for my birthday. 
And so I stood up in this sermon and I explained that this was a $100 bill that I had gotten for my birthday. Now, I think we all know that, that birthday money is supposed to be fun money. It's supposed to be what you get to do, whatever you want with it. Every once in a while, we'll have seasons in life where birthday money pays the bills and it has to, but that's not what we want birthday money to be for. So I explained this was birthday money, it was fun money, and then I burned it in front of them. I lit it, burned it right in front of all of them before I preached on 1 Timothy 6.10. I wanted to show how shocking it would be for them and how that might show that they had too much love for money. Didn't happen. They, they, they never forgot about that. They, every one of them thought that it was wrong. I had broken the law. I was wasteful. There were starving children. They never heard anything else I said. When I left, it was still like the one thing I did wrong was when I burned that $100 bill. I heard about a preacher, this is great, I've never done this, I can't do it now because I'm telling you, but I heard about a preacher who came up to the pulpit, I don't have a pulpit, so it would never work for me, he came up to the pulpit, set a Budweiser right on the pulpit, cracked it, and he preached his sermon and drank from the Budweiser the entire sermon. At the end, it was a Pepsi that he had put in a label on. At the end, he peeled the label off and said, you know, you haven't heard anything I've said because you were so focused on this Budweiser. Probably a mistake. I heard a story about a youth pastor, and, and he wanted to talk about deception with his kids. So he baked chocolate chip cookies with his kids, but he had changed all of the ingredients in all the bottles so, like, in the cinnamon thing, he had put chili powder, you know, that kind of thing. In the sugar, he had put salt. So, so when they were baking it, all of these ingredients it looked like chocolate chip cookies, but it wasn't. And then he wanted them to eat the cookies, and then he was going to talk about deception. Well, there was one kid in the youth group, he had no idea whose taste buds didn't work. And this kid said, I'll eat the cookies. And he ate it, took a big bite, and the youth pastor was all excited for the kid to retch, you know, like, ah! And he just kept eating cookies. <laughs> Didn't work. We're working our way through a series on miracles. Today is a destructive miracle. Did you get that? Today is a destructive miracle, and there are lots of believers that think that Jesus goes too far in our story today, and they have a hard time getting his point. Do you have your Bible open? Mark chapter 11, I'm starting in verse 12. It says, The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for pigs. And then he said, to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Verse 15 says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, and they began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered in verse 22. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their hearts, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. You stop right there. A destructive miracle. The point of the destructive miracle, the first thing that I want you to hear is that the point of the destructive miracle is Jerusalem. The point of the destructive miracle is the temple. The point of the destructive miracle is Jewish worship. It is over. 
The old covenant, the old system, the sacrifices, the temple, everything is over. It is cursed. It is finished. It has become a fruitless fake. And Jesus judges it. In verse 12, it says it was the next day and they were in Bethany and Jesus was hungry. This is actually tomorrow. Today is Palm Sunday, and that's the day before in our story when Jesus had gone in Jerusalem and, and they had chanted praises to him and palm branches, and, and it must have been just a very full day. And, and a lot of people think that maybe Jesus didn't actually have dinner that night because of the crowds and because of all that happened. In the first century, Jewish people ate two meals a day. They ate at 10 a.m. and they ate at 7 p.m., It says in Matthew that this was very early in the morning. Jesus has gotten his disciples up early, and they've headed back into Jerusalem. They're in Bethany. It's a two-mile walk. And along the way, they come across this fig tree. It says in verse 13, he sees it. It's in leaf. It has no fruit. And then Mark tells us it was not the season for figs. Now, I am no dendrologist, and neither was Jesus. He was a carpenter. But Jesus cut down a lot of trees. A dendrologist would tell you that the rule of fig trees is that in the spring, when you see leaves, there's going to be fruit on that tree. A fig has flowers. The flowers turn into fruit, and then leaves grow to shade that fruit. Now, the first thing that comes out of a fig tree, the fruits, when they first come out, they're edible. They're not great, but they're edible. So this is what Jesus is expecting But Mark tells us, and we want to be very careful here not to soften this story. A lot of interpreters try to soften what Jesus does. Mark says, don't do that. Mark says, it was not the season for for figs. Now, Mark is not a dendrologist, and the word season that he uses is a very interesting word. It is a theological term that has to do with God's timing. Verse 15, they get to Jerusalem. Temple courts, he drives out those that are buying and selling, and he doesn't allow them to do what they're doing. He curses the fig tree. They go into Jerusalem. He goes right to the temple. This is the second time that Jesus will drive out. This is the second time that he'll make a mess of the temple. The first time is Jesus' very first trip to Jerusalem for his ministry. It's not his first trip to Jerusalem in his life. We know that he goes when he's 12, but this is his ministry has started. He's going to have a three-year ministry. He begins with follow with with John the Baptist and his baptism, and he's going to end with his death on the cross and his resurrection. Three-year period. The very first time he goes, he goes to the temple, and he goes and he makes a whip, and he drives out those that are selling, and he overturns tables, and he says, my house is to be a house of prayer. The first time is a caution. Now, this is the second time. The first time, he says, things need to change around here. Now, this is the second time, and this is not a caution, this is a curse. Jesus will tell a story during his three years of ministry. In Luke chapter 12, he tells a story of a landowner who has a vineyard. And in the center of the the vineyard is a fig tree. And he goes, comes to his vineyard, and he goes to get figs, and there's no figs on the fig tree. And so he says to his gardener, he says, I want your best attention focused on that fig tree. I want you to fertilize it. I want you to water it. I want you to prune it. And when I come back, I want figs. And three years later, he comes back in the story that Jesus tells. And there's no figs. And he says to the gardener, he says, you cut that tree down. We're not wasting good soil on a worthless tree. Now Jesus comes back three years later. And he goes to the temple. And now, did you notice, it says that he stopped those that were buying. Those were the pilgrims. Those were us. Those were the religious people that were coming. They weren't doing anything wrong. It says that he was stopping those that were buying and selling. Jesus is stopping what happens in the temple. He is stopping sacrifice. Now, he only stops it for a moment here, but it's going to stop forever. And not that long of a distance in the future as far as history goes. 
And then he does what a lot of prophets did in the Old Testament. He has this prophetic object lesson. Prophets. If you're new around here, a prophet is someone who speaks for God to God's people, sometimes with judgment, sometimes about the future. A prophet in the Old Testament by the name of Zedekiah, he had an object lesson with iron horns. The prophet Isaiah, God made him walk around naked for three years. That was his object lesson. Jeremiah broke a clay jar as his object lesson. Hosea had to marry a prostitute for his object lesson. Verse 17. Jesus says, my house is to be a house of prayer for the nations, but you've turned it into a den of robbers. There's two quotes here. If you look in your Bible, you can see that there's two quotes here. It first says, a house of prayer for all the nations. And that's from the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, that guy that had to do three years in the nude. And Isaiah 56, Isaiah is talking about the future, and he's talking about the temple. Now, in the Old Testament, it's said about the temple that there were some people that weren't allowed to go to the temple. Eunuchs weren't allowed to go to the temple. Gentiles, people that were not Jewish, were not allowed to go into the temple. And Isaiah 56, Isaiah is talking about the future, and he has eunuchs going into the temple, and he has Gentiles. And the crazy thing in Isaiah 56 is the Gentiles actually appear to be the priests who are doing the sacrificing, which is like over the board, over the, over the wall crazy involved. My house is to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Where this event takes place, where Jesus does this, is in the court of the Gentiles where they were allowed to come. Jesus then says, but you've turned it into a den of robbers. That's actually a quote from Jeremiah, that prophet that had to break the clay jar. In Jeremiah chapter 7, he said that God's house had become a den of robbers. You understand what the den is, right? It's not where the robbing happens. It's where the robbers come back to hide with their loot. It's where they come to, 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 sacri- to celebrate the stealing that they've had. Jeremiah chapter 7, that's where that quote comes from. Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah says, I'll take away my harvest. There are no more figs on the tree. Israel is compared to a fig tree repeatedly in the Old Testament. There in Jeremiah, Hosea compares them to a fig tree. And then in Micah 7.1, it actually says, What misery is mine, God is talking. No figs that I crave, no early figs that I crave. No one is upright. And then we get to verse 20. So we came to Jerusalem We curse the fig tree because it didn't have any figs. We go in the temple. We stop sacrificial worship. We curse the temple. We're done. And then it's the next day, morning. And they went along the same route, and they saw all the withered roots. And then Peter has the aha moment. Now it's Tuesday of Holy Week, the week that we're in right now. It's Tuesday. They're walking back. It says roots were withered. I don't, you usually can't see roots, but sometimes you can, especially in our rocky Southern California soil, which is very much like the soil in Jerusalem. Sometimes the tree's roots grow up above the ground, which allowed Peter and the disciples to see that not only was the tree dead, but its roots were dead. Anybody ever had a tree that you wish the roots were dead? When Claudia and I bought our house, Butch Melville came over with his tractor. There was a pepper tree in the backyard, ginormous thing that we cut down. He dug out of the ground. We've lived in that house for 16 years. I still kill pepper tree roots every spring. This tree was dead to the roots. Trees don't die in a day. This is a destructive miracle. I think It's going to remind the disciples of another prophet in the Old Testament. His name is Jonah. He's kind of a famous prophet. His story is kind of a famous story. Jonah, he's told to go to Nineveh and to tell them that if they don't change, if they don't repent, that God's going to judge them. He doesn't want to do that. He wants God to judge them. He's really looking forward to a good hellfire and brimstone. God fish and spit him out, and he goes, and he tells the Ninevites, unless you change... 
God's going to wipe you off the planet. And then in Jonah chapter 4, at the end of the story, Jonah actually goes up on a hillside to watch hellfire and brimstone. Like, he doesn't believe that they're going to change. They're horrible people. So he goes to watch, and when he's sitting in this hillside watching, blazing sun comes up, and then God grows a vine, just a miracle. Just all of a sudden, this vine grows, perfectly shades Jonah. You know, he's just watching the game in the shade. Budweiser, I don't know. Waiting for the hellfire. Doesn't happen on day one. Day two, he's back. And it says that a worm came and ate the, the tree, the vine, and it withered. Same word. Only time it happens in the Old Testament, now it's in the New Testament. And it withered and died, and Jonah's mad at God. God, I want you to judge these people, not me. Verse 22. Jesus says, and if you have this kind of faith, you could say to this mountain into the sea, and then Jesus talks about prayer, and then Jesus says, if we don't forgive, we're not forgiven. When I was reading the text, did you just decide that Jesus had ADHD? Like, this all made sense. We fig tree and Jerusalem and cursed Jerusalem and we're done with the Old Covenant. We're done with the Old Testament. We're not doing sacrifices here anymore. Jesus, the author of Hebrews says, is our one and only sacrifice once for all. It all makes sense. And then Jesus, like, signals, turns without signaling. Squirrel, what are you doing, Jesus? He says, this mountain. It's very important that you understand he's pointing at Jerusalem. He's pointing at Mount Zion, the mountain that Jerusalem is built on. If you had been reading the Gospel of Mark, the first time that you would have read the word see is in Mark chapter 5. Patrick preached on Jesus and the Gerizim demoniac, the one that came, Jesus came across this man that had thousands of demons in him, and, and then Jesus put the demons in the pigs, and then the pigs ran and fell into the first time the word see occurs in the gospel of mark these demons were judged and destroyed and then in mark chapter 9 jesus is talking about the little children and he says if we teach something that causes the little children to go astray it would be better for us to have a millstone that's a really big giant donut rock put around our neck and then we should try to go swim across the Mediterranean. So it would be better for us to have a millstone tied around our neck and to be thrown into the sea than to meet God face to face after we had been teaching little ones lies. One plus one, and now we get to three. Third time the word sea happens in the Gospel of Mark. And we have religious leaders that are demoniacs, selfish, evil men. And they are leading the children of Israel astray. And Jesus says, I, he's not talking to his disciples, he's talking about himself. I will say to this mountain, you have been judged and you are going in the sea. Now for us, Jerusalem is a neat place to go to on vacation. But Jesus' disciples must have been very un upset about this. If there's no more Jerusalem, where will we go for sacrifices? Where will we go for forgiveness? And the, Jeru the Jews also had a superstition that if they went to Jerusalem, that their prayers were more heard by God. Something else that the religious leaders had pr propagated to get people to come and to buy their junk. Where are we going to go for our special prayers? Jesus says, you can talk to God anywhere. By faith, you can talk to God anywhere. But when you talk to him, you make sure that you are not angry, bitter about somebody else. It's a destructive miracle. A lot of people get upset with Jesus for killing a tree. I'm not so sure that you're upset about that, but I bet you do have some questions about judgment and maybe about prayer. 
So I want to talk about those two things for just a second. Judgment is not a miracle. A miracle is something that defies nature. Judgment is part of God's nature. God is just. God is holy. God is perfect. I don't want to use the word good because it's not good enough. When we meet God, judgment will happen because it is his nature. We need to be careful not to take the teeth out of Jesus' mouth. In our very modern Western Christianity, more and more we are pulling the teeth out of Jesus' mouth. And we're making him just this nice, kind, sweet, always loving, everybody Savior. He is God. And he will not tolerate evil. And if we do not have faith in him, when we meet him and we say to him, do I know you? Then he's going to say to us, do I know you? And judgment is something that will happen. We're Christ followers. Let's be very careful that we pay attention to in this story, faith equals fruit. Our love of Jesus always should be evident in actions. Pump the brakes. I'm not suggesting works salvation. Jesus' work on the cross is where sin is judged and condemned. There's nothing we can do to condemn sin. Only Jesus can do that. But we want to be in a constant working relationship with him because that's how the relationship is sustained. Jesus said to them, you're living in a den of robbers. And so if church is the place where we hide all of our sins, we come here, act like everything's great, I got a perfect marriage, I got perfect kids, I got perfect job, I got perfect finances, I ne- I'm just, well, really, Jesus is glad I'm on his team. But none of that is true. Now, I'm talking to you and your heart. You know that if people knew, you'd have some hard conversations. Jesus is saying, you can't come to the church and hide like those religious leaders were hiding in the temple. You will not make my house a den of robbers. And then he talks about prayer. And so I just want to hover here for a second and then we're done. Prayer taken out of context makes God sound like that he's a genie. And so what makes prayer most effective that's what i think we all want to know like how do i get my prayers answered number one jesus says right here has to be by faith mark chapter 11 verse 23 when we pray we believe we're talking to a living god who hears our prayers loves us and cares number two jesus says uh, he says it has to be in obedience he said that here but in first john 3 22 john said we will we will receive because we obey now here and in the ser- in jesus sermon on the mount where he gives the lord's prayer it also has to be connected to unforgive has to be connected to forgiveness we cannot live a life without unforgiveness if we are harboring hate for someone It's going to separate us from God. It may not separate us from God today. It may not separate us from God tomorrow. But if we harbor hate day in and day out, our relationship with God will get pushed out. And so Jesus says it can't be connected to unforgiveness. In Matthew, I'm sorry, in Luke, in a story that he tells about a widow, it's connected with persistence. We want to be praying over and over again. We want to pray the prayers that Jesus prayed. You want to know the prayers that Jesus prayed? He prayed that God would send workers out to the harvest. I think about John's work on our stage today. 
Jesus prayed that the Holy Spirit would come. When was the last time you said, Holy Spirit, come help me today? Jesus said that we would pray to bear fruit. And Jesus said that we would pray for wisdom. Those are prayers. You pray with Jesus. You'll get those answers. Acts tells us that we pray in cooperation with other believers. So it's okay for us to ask other people to pray for us. And then finally, James. It's interesting. We read read this just this morning in our New Testament Bible reading plan. I had no idea. But James chapter 4, verse 3 says, we pray with unselfish motives. If we are praying for some sin to come into our lives, God is not going to bless that prayer. Object lesson. I can't really do this on the stage, but it's another one of my favorites when I talk to little children. You take a bag of Skittles and a white plate, and you line the Skittles up all around the outside of the white plate. And then you take hot water, and I try to explain to children, sometimes we talk about when life's not going well, we're in hot water. And you take hot water and you pour it in the middle of the plate, and of course it spreads out to the Skittles. And then a beautiful thing happens. The Skittles begin to bleed their colors, and they bleed into the middle of the plate, usually making a gorgeous, swirling rainbow. And that's a great picture of prayer. When we're in hot water and we're connected to one another, hand in hand, arm in arm, doing this life with Jesus together with others, that hot water turns our prayers into something beautiful. Would you pray with me right now? Gracious God, I thank you very, very much for Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross. Jesus, we deserve to be cursed, just like that fig tree, but we are not. Because you cursed sin and death when you gave your life on the cross, when you became a curse for us. Jesus, we thank you for the cross. And Jesus, we pray that you help us. We pray that you help us to be an object that you would be able to use as a good lesson in our families, at our workplace with our neighbors. Lord, we pray that when people look at us, they see you. And wherever we're faking it, we pray that you help us to stop. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. David? I invite you to stand.
to remain standing. If you're guests with us, thank you for joining us today. We're going to sing one last song. I'll put the song at the end of the message so that if God has been speaking to you, there's a time that you can respond. And it said in verse 17, Jesus said, it is, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that prophecy in Isaiah 56 was about people that didn't think they were welcomed in God's house, being a part of God's house. You might be here today and you might think because of the things you have done, because of the things you have said, because of the people that you have hurt, that God could never forgive you, but that's a lie. God can and will forgive anything and everything if we cry out to Jesus for help. If you're here today and you've never done that, but you're ready to ask Jesus to forgive you, come talk to me. I'm going to go out into the foyer and we'll start a conversation about what it means to follow him. If you're watching this message online, thank you for joining us. If you're ready to respond to Jesus today, I challenge you to send me an email. My email is my first name, Marshall, at lakesidechristian.org. You email me, I promise I'll email you back. And you tell me that you are ready to follow Jesus. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter where you are right now. If you will turn to Jesus, he will receive you. But for the rest of us, I'm going to get letters for saying this, but we cannot make Jesus a toothless granny. Just sweet little kisses all the time. He is sweet and he is kind. But he is king and he is holy. And we have to be careful that we live in a relationship with him not in a relationship with sin. Amen. Pastor Dave?
came and ministered and did everything right in the right time. God, help us heed his warning. Help us see his way he treated unfaithful Israel. Help us to be faithful and follow you at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for being in worship. If you haven't signed up for the prayer watch and you want to, please do that today on your way out.